start? All right, everybody. Good morning. I'm even better. You were partying too hard. Good morning. All right, we're here for the Let's Wreck This Together Apex Talks. This is our, our second year doing the Let's Wreck This Together Apex Talks, and we have a fabulous lineup of, of speakers. Um, but before we get to that, when we started looking at the content, when, when the content for this conference started coming in back in October, um, I started getting nervous. I started looking at the presentations and thinking, I don't know, this is, uh, this is looking a little hard, and are we going to have the right content? And we start looking through all of it, and my nervousness started sub to subside when I remember the great team that I had behind me and all the people in the committee that were selecting presentations. So uh, I want to give a big round of applause to, uh, to the people that are here that were part of the committee. So if you, if you guys could uh, stand up that we're helping select presentations, please. Thank you very much. And we have, about, we have about other six people that are not here that are remote. So a big shout out to uh, other, others that could not be here, but they still volunteer their time to select the content of, the present, of this, session, this, uh, this conference. Um, I think they did a great job. What do you guys think? And, and before I forget, I'm just going to give a shout out, shout out to my daughters, because they may be watching. Marina, Marisol, just want to say hi. All right. You know, they're eight and six. All right. So the format is going to be, we're going to go through some present presenters. We're going to have Scott Spendolini, Martin D'Souza, Peter Raganich, Vincent Morneau. We're going to have a quick intermission, and then we'll go to Kerry Millsap, Dimitri Gillis, Shakib Rahman and Joel Kalman. And I'm going to be trying to coordinate them and get your questions. Feel free to uh, be ready with questions when, when the speaker is done with their 10-minute uh, presentation, then you can ask some questions. And we may be taking some questions from Twitter. So if you're watching us on, on the live stream, uh, use the ORCL Apex hashtag to tweet your questions, and we'll be reading them out loud and trying to, to uh, field them to the presenters. All right, so first, we're going to have Scott Spendolini talking about 10 obscure yet useful features in Apex. Thank you, Jorge. Shout out to my baby brother who is also possibly watching on the live stream. Hi, Brian. Stop texting me about the technical glitches. Um, I'm going to start, and I'm going to break a couple rules here, if, if you guys don't mind. We're not supposed to talk about customers. We're not supposed to market our services. But I landed a pretty good reference customer. Um, being in DC, a lot of federal government work, and they made a video. And I just want to share what they had to say about Application Express before we start. I was going to do this Sunday night, but evidently things took a turn for the worst. Let's listen. If you like your service, you'll absolutely love Application Express. Treat yourself to the very, very best life has to offer. And as a gift, Application Express. To the best you can give. One bite and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And believe me, I understand Database. it's my favorite food and these are the best. What can I say? <laughs> Pretty glowing reference, so uh, anyway. I'm going to go through top 10 obscure features in Apex. These are things that I've found over time, and some very recently, some, wow, like 10 or 12 years ago. They're things that don't help every day. Some might, but it's good to know that they're there. And in the interest of what happened on Sunday night, I only have one slide, so I can't hit next slide. I'm going to start with about. Many people don't realize that right under this menu here, the question mark, if I select about, I get all kinds of important information about my Apex environment. This is pretty critical when you're logging an SR with Oracle support or you're trying to troubleshoot something. 
and you're not sure of the versions of the different components, the different settings. So as you scroll through the list here, you'll see the, the, the build, the schema compatibility, last EDL time, all your web server components as well, so the version of orgs that you're running, uh, the schemas, uh, the queries that it's running here, and then all the way down to the bottom, you'll get your database version as well as your character set NLS parameters. So yeah, this isn't something you're gonna use right away, but it's really useful to know that it's here. Otherwise, you'd have to go in and you know, go into SQL Workshop and do the begin, OAUtil, print CGI, ANV, that only gets you part of this. Then you've got a query of the dollar table on the database, you get the database information. So it's nice that it's here. It's, I mean, how many people have seen this screen before? All right, so it's not terribly obscure. Let's try to find something more obscure. Export page. So this one comes in really handy, and I do use this one quite a bit. I'm just going to go ahead and pick a page in the sample database application here. If you're about to do something stupid, right, I'm going to change all the processes to use web services instead of built-in DML. Or all the PL SQL code that's here, I'm going to push to a PL SQL package, and then I want to change how I reference it. Or maybe I'm removing something. It's not a bad idea to click on the little wrench and click export. This puts you in a page where you're going to export only this specific page of the application. It's very nice to have the backup if your experiment or your thing that you did works, just discard the backup and move along. If it doesn't work, you can import this page right back into your application, bring you right back where you were. The other reason to use this is the as of X minutes ago. So quite often you might have deleted the wrong report or altered a report that used to work really well and now it's slow or it's returning the wrong data. It's not a guarantee that it's gonna be there. It all has to do with the amount of flashback space in, in the database, but if you do export as of say four minutes ago, right after you made a mistake and then re-import the page, there's a pretty good chance all your stuff is gonna be there for you. But again, that, that's not guaranteed. If flashback isn't set up, if the pool is small, you may not get that. New pages copy. I do this quite a bit when I've got stuff on a page that I like and I want to move it to another page. So rather than going in, let's go back to the main screen here, page as copy will let me take this page and retain all the stuff on it. This is like my OCD feature, right? So if I'm creating page 200, 210, and 230, and somehow I did 200, 210, and nine, it ain't gonna fly, right? I'm gonna go to nine, create a new page as a copy, copy that to 220, remove nine, everything is retained. Now, make sure you look in your code, sometimes the item references won't copy over. Um, if it's the original page number, they usually do copy to the new one, but if it's other page numbers, there's a, a chance that you might lose those, so you have to go in and modify them. But you just select page in this app, pick a new page number, new page name. Um, if you want to do navigation entry and all that stuff, you could do that as well. So we'll go ahead and say this is going to be a customers, hit next. And then pick all the different region names on the page. I'm typically taking all the defaults here because I'm literally cloning the page. Copy to other page. This one's pretty cool, and you may not know about this one. If you right-click a region or an item or a dynamic action or any tree component, one of the new features of Five is the ability to copy this to another page in your application. So you're not copying the full page, but rather a specific component. This I use quite a bit if you've got, say, a report that is gonna be similar across two or three pages and you've already set everything up, you've got your authorization schemes, you've got your, your grid attributes and all that stuff. I create it once and then I copy it to another page. So in this case, well, page three doesn't exist, but page nine, hit next. Same concept here, it's gonna give you the high level attributes if I'm good with it. I hit copy. The one thing about this feature that would be nice is to have some sort of confirmation, little green icon on the upper right corner perhaps, pop open and say item successfully copied. It doesn't give you that feedback, um, but it does work. So if I were to go to the page nine, that region would be there. Cross page utilities. 
these are buried, right? We're kind of going into the, the darker corners of Apex now. Under application utilities, and then over on the right hand side, cross page utilities come in pretty useful for a couple different things. Typically, the grid edit of all pages is where you want to go when, let's say, you forget to put authorization schemes on every page. If I've got 20, 30 pages, editing each one individually, setting the authorization scheme, and going to the next one is pretty tedious. I could come over here and just select them pretty quickly and then go ahead and hit my apply changes and be done with it. I could also change the title, the alias, the name of the page, the page template, which isn't important anymore with the universal theme or isn't as important. Um, but it's a neat little place that I could do multiple actions on a group of pages. Same with delete multiple pages. Quite often I've got an app with 20, 30 pages in it. I want to start another app that's going to be pretty similar. I'm going to copy that app and then I'm going to delete 29 of the 30 pages and start from scratch that way. So being able to delete multiple pages is also pretty helpful. I can come down here and just select all the ones I want to delete and away they go. Debug history. So how many people use Apex debug mode? How many people look at the history once they've done it, right? So what you do is you just rerun the debug and you get a second one. You could go in under, let's pick our sample database app here, and if we go to administration, monitor activity, down here we could take a look at, where is it hiding? It's too obscure. All right, application errors. This is, that's what, I'm, that's what I meant. I meant application errors. This is going to show you a history of your errors. The debug one, it's in there somewhere. I've got to find it. But it's another one that's pretty useful. Application errors is probably one of the things <clears throat> we ignore. No errors. That's good news. Um, Apex is going to track this stuff. And if you're a developer and you're not proactively looking after your error log, you're not going to know what's happening. So it's good to instrument error handling, but it's useless if you're not monitoring it. So this is another good report you want to keep an eye on. Um, any kind of error that the Apex engine throws, so not necessarily JavaScript um, unless it's through a dynamic action. You'll see things even like a validation shows up as an error, so you might want to filter some of those out. I mean, a validation firing is fine. That's what they're there for. But unhandled errors that, that bubble up, they'll all show up in that report. And if you're ignoring it, I mean, it, it, what's great is you can actually proactively fix issues if you see them show up in the error log. Preferences. I don't have a demo, but I do want to show the get preference and the set preference function um, in the user doc. If you need to store <coughs> user preferences, there's no need to create a table. Apex has this capability built in so that your users can store any name, any preference, and map that to their username so that when they log back in again, you can simply read that value and do whatever you need to do. So things like language, date format mask, um, maybe color of the screen or something like that can be stored as an Apex preference. Don't create another table and write some code to maintain it. It's already in the tool um, and it works just great. So get preference, set preference are the next two. Exception reports. This is um, over in SQL Workshop now, so let's jump over here. Under Utilities, under Object Reports, down in the lower left-hand corner here, this is a neat little section of reports you can run before you push an application out to production. So which tables don't have primary keys? Maybe perfectly fine, right? That's your design to not have a primary key in this table, but at least it highlights those for you. Um, tables without indexes, tables or the index, unindexed foreign keys, and then tables without triggers. Again, you're not going to use this every day, but every once in a while this is interesting to run because you just don't take that time to do an analysis of your different schema objects. These reports will do that for you. And then less obscure are all these reports. These are all very interesting reports. Um, the security ones, all objects, um, PL SQL reports, and then all your different table reports. You're not going to run these all every day as well, but they're good to know that, that they're out there. Methods on tables. <clears throat> How many people knew about methods on tables? If you need to create a table API, right, so rather than using the automatic row fetch processes, you want to create some PL SQL on top of a table, navigate over to Object Browser, hit Create a Package, 
and then select package, whoops, package with methods on database tables. This will step you through about a three step wizard. We'll call it demo. I'm going to pick a table to use for this. So let's just do demo orders. You can do multiple ones um, if you want in the same package. And then what it actually does is it'll create APIs that you could use to insert, update, and delete data on that table. So if you're building something that needs a little more security, that leads, needs a little bit more control, you could use this to generate your packages and then remove what you don't want, right? So if you don't want them to pass tags, simply remove that from the spec, you've got a much more secure approach to managing the different data in these tables. And then the last one, which is also SQL Workshop, lookup tables. If I go into the object browser, and I want to make a lookup table. Let's say username shouldn't be in here. I want user ID, and I want to push username out to another table. All I have to do is hit create lookup table, pick the column, hit next, and then create my lookup table. I now have a table here called username lookup, which has a primary key of username. It'll have a distinct list of all the distinct values in my base table. And then if we take a look at demo orders, you'll notice now that username is no longer in the table, but rather username ID. So literally three clicks and I can take that table, normalize it, and push it out to a lookup table. That's it. Any questions? Can I go back to the last slide? Absolutely. You mean the first slide? The only slide. Any questions? Any questions on Twitter? Great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Off to the airport. Well, our next presenter setting up, Martin D'Souza. He is uh, director, of, uh, director of Innovation at Insum and base director, contributor of open source projects, and all around well known speaker. Um, you can check out his stockapex.com uh, website for blogs. Thanks, sir. Safe trip. <laughs> I'm, he's going to talk with a topic called optimizing laziness. Maybe? Maybe. maybe. What, what screen resolution? Can you guys see this? Hold on, that's really small. Okay, thank you. Jurgen. Um, Hold on, I'm, I'm dealing with the screen here. Can you guys see the screen? No? Let's do this. Hold on, let's try and unplug and replug. This is the support I give my mom. Okay, we'll, we'll just deal with that. I'll blow, I'll blow things up. Just give me one second. Can you... Jurgen, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah? Okay. And okay. Jurgen, can you hear me okay? Okay. I'll I'll put I'll put this here. It'll be kind of awkward, but all right. So I, I'm gonna talk about optimizing laziness. So how many people here are lazy developers? Okay, the rest of you that don't put your hands up, that's not a good thing. Right? You wanna think lazy. And just just to clarify. It could be too lazy. <laughs> Sorry, what was the comment in the back? I didn't hear. Oh, that's good. There. Yeah, so those that put up your hands, yeah, I didn't think of it that way. But For the live stream, the comment was too lazy to, to raise my hand. Hands. So to, to clarify, I, I, want, I want you guys to think of this. Now think of how many people here bike? And I'm talking like road biking. Real, a couple people. If, if you've ever biked and you've ever biked up a hill, you know the pain that you go through. And then the down the hill, everyone's used to going downhill probably in the same way, right? And I just want you to think about this, right? what, what you've done all your years. Now, I also have to caveat this because I don't want any legal problems. Do not do this at home. What you're going to see is a trained professional, and it's not me. But I want you to look at this, right? 
and think about how you code versus everyone else because think you want to be that person in the yellow, you don't want to be everyone else, right? He's doing the exact same thing with just so much less effort and he's getting so much more output, right? So think about that. Ask yourself who you are. Are you the person biking? Look at this guy, he's smoking everyone and he's doing nothing, right? Again, do not do this at home. Do not do this on your bike. Do so you guys get that? So think about that every single time when you develop. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna show you guys three things today on how to be, how to optimize laziness for, for development. And none of them are specific to Apex, but I think it will all help how you develop. So the first thing is what I call Node.js build checks. So how many people here actually have to prepare releases or do releases? A few? Okay. You're, you're probably involved with it. And if you actually do a release through like dot SQL and you hand it off to DBA, there are certain things that usually tend to fail. So I'm talking about, does everyone know that if you don't have a forward slash at the end of a package, it does not compile? Yes? Okay, how many of you actually remember to do that? Because SQL developer masks it for you. Alex is the only person, yeah. A few people, but the problem is most developers don't. And we ended up getting into this fight where you can harass developers to do it or accept the fact that they don't. And so what we've, what we've done is for one of our clients is we had so many developers on the project, I was losing the fight and I said, you know what, this is stupid. I shouldn't harass people. We can pre-validate this. So we actually, uh, just to show you, using Node.js or you can do this actually all in Bash, but, oh, now I've got to blow this up. Can you guys read that screen? It, it's not too critical, but. Uh, that you read it, but if uh, we, um, before we do a build, we'll do something like this to check, and all of a sudden, it tells us that this view is me missing the word force, uh, there's some SVN tags missing, and this package is missing a forward slash at the end. And this might seem minor to some of you, but when you have a release with hundreds of files, and 30 of those files are missing those things, it can cost you a lot of time because when you actually do deployments, it stops and then you have to get other people involved. So th I, I'm not gonna produce a script, we might blog about it, but I just want you to think of those types of things that if you're constantly doing repetitive tasks that can be easily checked, you can write a script for it, right? So think about that, script your way out of those problems. Uh, we, just to let you know other things we do, we actually uh, export Apex as part of that whole build. I, I just took it out for for speed purposes, we'll, we'll check one of our problems is some of our people that write the release are actually just business analysts and they just write to date without a date format. And when the date formats are different between development and prod, you get a little surprise. Uh, so we, we do all those sort of things that we can so we're not bugging them and we can pre-validate a release. So the next thing, code peaking. Last year, who was here last year for Thursday's talk? Okay, so you remember I scolded you on certain things and I showed you uh, Adam. Uh, let's just, because there's not as many people. How many people here are using Notepad++? Okay, stop. Okay, we are in 2017, stop it. Like, go and delete the app. And it's not that it's bad, it's just there's faster way. You're those people biking downhill, putting in all the effort. There's better apps such as Adam or Visual Studio Code, all free. The only thing is it takes time for you to learn it, but it's one of those things that's worth the time. And one of the feedback when, when we implement this sometimes, people saying, well, I don't want to spend the time to learn. Right? It's not worth it. I said, well, the same people said that with a horse and buggy when they wanted, didn't want to go to, to a car. They're like, well, a horse and buggy works great. Yes, but a car is much faster. Right? So you want to think about that. Stop using Notepad++. There's so many reasons why you don't want to use it. Martin, you, you forgot to mention Sublime Text. Yes, Sublime Text. I'm not getting into that argument. But Sublime Text 2 is, it's okay. Yeah. But you want to get to, long story short is you want to stop like you're developing in 1980 and go to 2017, whether that's Atom, Notepad Plus, or Atom, Sublime Text, or Studio Code. So I'm going to show you a cool feature in Studio Code. Uh, and Atom has this, uh, let me just try and blow it up. Oops, that's a little too big. So the code is irrelevant on this. But what happens usually is you're in one package, and I, 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 this is an OSUtil thing, and I'm calling this, this Mac function. 
and I want to see what parameters are in it. How many people here actually go like this, copy it and say, oh, I'm going to double click on the file, open it, then hit Control F and type in Mac, and then scroll down and find the parameters? How many people here do that on an average? Most of you do that? Okay. Now, those that are a little faster, if you're using a modern thing, you may do a shortcut and just type in crypto, right? And, and then all of a sudden you can open the package and then you have to go hit Control F and you type in Mac and then you find it or, or you use like a, a navigator. All of those are good, but sometimes that, that distracts you and you, if you already have 20 tabs open, it can really slow things down. What if you could just right click and go peak definition and it showed up right here? Wouldn't that be quicker? Nice? Yes. And, and then the cool thing is if you just double click, it opens up right to that point in time. So that can save you a lot of time because sometimes all you want to see is what the header information is. Now, uh, at Visual Studio Code has this. Adam has a peak function as well, but uh, we've, we've, as a, we've actually pushed a pull request to them and they're going to implement the Oracle version of it soon, hopefully in Adam. Now, just to let you know, for Visual Studio Code, if you are going to use it, you, you want to read this blog from Morton Branton, and I'm not going to put the URL. All you want to search for is Visual Studio Code and PL SQL development, because you do have to add in some plugins there. All right, what's number three? Okay, any questions on that so far? Cool? All right, document generation. Uh, I, th I, I always talk about this because it's a, it's a hot topic. So how many people here usually write their code then write documentation and, and give it to a manager or someone? Yes? Well, yeah, that's the fun part of your job. We all love it. And the problem is that once you write that document, uh, then it goes to managers and then it's dead because you've already patched it and it's changed. Or how many people have templates that they have to fill out above their package that not really meaningful or they don't do much with it? Anyone? A few people? Okay. All those, they're kind of useless. You're doing it because that's the way it's always been done, but no one's questioned it. So you want to question those types of things, right? If you're going to do something, you want to provide value for actually doing it. And thankfully, documentation has a good standard out there. I know we're not a lot of Java fans, but Java doc was probably one of the best things that came out of Java. And Java doc notation looks something like this, where you've probably all seen this at param sort of syntax. And now, thankfully, we've written a, there's an open source uh, PL SQL generator that if you put this type of documentation in there where actually you keep up to date with meaningful documentation, we can generate, just from a command line script, it can generate pure markdown files. So if I go, if I go here, if you want to see, for those that were in the database presentation, uh, or the OS utils, all this documentation was just automatically generated. So if I go on OS Util strings and two car, and you can see the parameters and examples, all of that was generated just from putting in this content here. So it has meaning to it. So your developers aren't just saying, well, I'm writing it because so-and-so told me to write it. You're writing it because you can generate on the fly and as part of your build process, you always have up-to-date documentation. Now, the really cool thing is the way we built this was uh, is all template driven, and I'm showing you one thing. Now, those of you that know Jurgen, he, you know, we ho co host the Apex podcast, so if you haven't heard about it, you should. And we always, he always picks on me a lot. And he doesn't like Markdown, but since it's template driven, we actually can generate this through uh, as an HTML file. So I'm just going to change things here and just type in oops.html. And simply with one Oh, let me just do node app 1.0.0. So I'm going to generate the exact same documentation just by rerunning the build script. And if I go into my directory here, uh, let's just go into web, you can now see the exact same documentation. And I got to thank Vincent Morneau because he actually did the styling around this, right? And you can see the exact same documentation, but now in an HTML file. Nothing changes for the developer, right? They see the nice same output, and you can do it in Markdown, HTML, or whatever language you want. And so I think that this is really valuable for developers that when you're spending all that time and effort, don't waste it 
make sure it's useful, and then now, next time your, your manager comes up and says, hey, can you write the documentation, and they ask for an estimate, tell them a week. And uh, enjoy, uh, enjoy the 39 hours you'll have off, and it takes one hour to learn this program. And, and this is, by the way, on, uh, if you Google OS Utils, uh, so if you go to GitHub or open source, and I think it's called PLMD doc, I'll zoom in on that in a second. That's where the doc. So the question was from Jurgen for those on the live stream, why is it called PLMD doc? It's because the original plan was this was built for me, and it was meant for PL SQL and markdown documentation. But we're going to change it because Jurgen's very persistent. So if you, if you go to this URL, it, it's all there. It's all free right now. So I encourage you to go and use it today. And that are my, those are my three things. For those that didn't realize, that was not really a question. Jurgen's question was not really a question. Yeah. What's so a I'll, grievance? I'll, I'll take questions. <laughs> Thank you, Martin. No problem. <laughs> questions, yes. Wait, wait for the you mic. You need the mic okay. because people are listening. Can you just do uh, a video, training video for uh, Atom editor for us? Yeah. Uh, so the question is, can I do an Atom training? I, I will. There, there probably, there's just a lot of Google Atom 101. Yeah, but you are the guy, and, and, <laughs> and you know the tricks, and, and you're the, all the plugin stuff. You know, just for a regular Apex developer, okay. this is what you want to know about Atom and the plugins you want to install. And so okay. 30 minutes, 20. How about five? Hour. OK, we'll, 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 do, we'll work something out. So this we'll is a something. yes. We'll work something out. Any Thank other you. questions? <laughs> no? All right. Well, off to Peter then. Thanks. Well, our next speaker is uh, Peter Raganich. He is uh, co-CEO and founder of Foex. In Austria. Uh, he's been doing IT and work uh, in the IT industry for more than 20 years. Probably Thank you. a lot more. Um, and he's an AZ director, avid blogger, and very known speaker in many, uh, many uh, conferences. Peter's going to give us a little bit of information about speeding up our development. So you see a theme we're going on here. Uh, I think Peter's going to concentrate a little more from within the builder on Apex. Good morning. Can you hear the voice? It's all because of rehearsing over and over again. I wasn't out yesterday. I was just rehearsing. So. Um, yeah, uh, again, like, like Martin, I'm a lazy guy. I don't want to do too much work, actually. I don't enjoy doing the same things over and over again. So whenever it comes to, to development, I try to do as less or as little as possible. Sounds familiar? Yeah. So most of the time I call Matt and tell him, hey, Matt, could you look into that? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> I'm good. So anyway, um, Apex, you know, we all use it. And when you look at that screen, it's familiar, right? So there is, I can't tell you any new things other than take a close look again. What you can see here in Apex is what you show your customers. You give them interactive reports so they can adapt them, right? Has anyone of you ever changed this view? It's like 7.5% of the audience. It's not enough. So, you know, please go just here, add some columns. I don't know, do you have to do to deal with aliases or um, authorization schemes or anything like that? or maybe even versions, I don't know, just add those columns and you got them right in your face, right in front there. Ah, you can group by, 
you can order them, you can do all, all things you, you want to imagine. But still, every time I go to some customer site, all I see there is this one, right? Hundreds and hundreds of icons. And they all have the same name. And then they, they go around, oh, uh, there, yeah, yeah, just give me a second. There, there is my app. No, no, it's this one. Oh, yeah, there. Just switch to list view, group it, order it, use application um, groups. Anyone knows what that is? 0.8%? <laughs> and it's really difficult because it's hard to find, right? So it's right in here. You can assign an application group to an application. It doesn't do anything at all other than give you a, a, a method of grouping things. So big question now is there are some predefined groups. How can you define a new group? I forgot it, so please help me out. <laughs> you laugh, it's difficult. It's somewhere out there. <coughs> Application groups, hey, there we are. <coughs> and then we can create a new one. And then you can assign a group to your application. Everything's fine. Good? Okay. Same works within the page listing. Just add all those columns you're interested in, arrange them, group them, order them, however you want. And then you, you can easily jump and find your page and go into that page. Okay, that's it. So now, the search box. Who uses search? Okay, what do you do? You actually search for stuff? Or do you do things like Oh, let's go to page two. Or let's go to application 106, page one. Did you know about that? Yes? Okay, good. Do you know about go to 106S, like in super or shared components? It's a quick way to jump around. The only thing you probably shouldn't do in here is add a, what's it called, tilde? Because it gets lost. It's used as a separator character in here. So you can't really search for that. Okay, so. Trying to, to speed it up again. In Page Designer, and this is probably the best invention since a long time. Tree View was great in Apex 4. Page Design is awesome. Um, but you know, especially on small screens, you don't need all those panes there. So you just get rid of them and you, you rearrange stuff. You can drag and drop since Apex 5.1. You can drag and drop those tabs even from here to, I don't know, there. You can get rid of all of that. So you simply use what you're interested in. What you don't need, just put it out of the way. Right? And then you got the keyboard shortcuts in here. Have you seen this one? Shortcuts. It gives you a menu and it shows you, hey, there are some key bindings. I can do stuff. I can do Control Alt R and it runs the page. Oh, that's actually good. I can do Alt 1, it goes here, Alt 2 there. And you see, I can tap through everything 
just by hitting my, my keyboard. I don't really need the mouse for that. It's good? Mm -hmm. Not really impressed, okay. So when I really wanna speed things up, I actually bring in a, a browser add-on and Jorge, can you tell me the time? Uh, five more minutes. Okay, so um, we created an extension, it's free, there is no money involved at all. It's available for Chrome and um, Firefox. It's called the Foex Developer Add-on. Okay, so you add it. And this is probably the coolest thing. We have a, little, uh, a nice little icon there, right? But now, all of a sudden, we got super shortcuts. So I can say, um, please go to application definition. And we jump over there. Hey, uh, I wanna look up um, list items, go list items. Hey, that's nice. Oh, pack to page designer, go page designer. Nice stuff, right? It's good? Mm. This is helping out, right? I can do stuff like, hey, F8 runs the page. Or, blah, blah, hit F10, saving this. F8, run the page, do all those nice things. And this is really, oops, yeah, that's not good, starting did you, over. Did it just crash? Yeah. <laughs> We can do that too. <laughs> so I should probably, this is my top secret password. You wouldn't ever guess it. <laughs> okay, so yeah. We, we, we got those, those nice little things, keyboard shortcuts. Um, we added other things like, um, do you add JavaScript code to your applications? A lot? Okay. So you can go in here You know, you can do stuff like um, we we added stuff like, hey, please do nice styling there, or could you do um, syntax validation, and it gives you some JS lint abilities there, just checking, hey. Is that JavaScript code any any good at all? But mostly, what, what what's important in, in application builder is that you know your tools. You know, keyboard shortcuts are nice, but you want to jump across things pretty quick. So look at all those nice little icons. You got a go to share component icon, but you also go got a go back to go back to page designer icon, right? use those little things and then we love Apex so much, we actually added a bug. Because I love debugging, you know, I'm going over and over again and I mentioned debugging a lot. So we, we figured every time I, I change something in a page, I run it again, debug's lost. So we added this little bug so you can set your debug level and then simply hit run, and your page is run in debug mode. So adding bugs, good thing for once. Very nice. Nice. Problem. Very nice, Peter. Any questions? Comments? So I, I gotta ask, so the, the extension is called Forex, but we don't need Forex installed to use oh, it? Oh, not at all. It's simply called Forex. 
this developer add-on because Flow is proprietary. Wonderful. It's free. You don't need anything. It's awesome. It's good. Thank you, Peter. <laughs> Our next presenter is <coughs> Vincent Morneau. Uh, you guys may have heard about Vincent at the beginning of, of the conference. Uh, he is a uh, front-end developer at Insum. Uh, we go to him with all sorts of problems. But he's also the newest ace. So oh, thank you. And you may have seen this Apex Nitro stickers going around. And who's heard of Apex Nitro this week? Some of you, great. And that's who, pretty good. That's, that's really good. Um, well, Vince is going to introduce us to Apex Nitro officially. All right, hey, I'm going to have to need the micro, because I'll go in the crowd just for a second later. Yes. Thanks. Not now, though. All right, so um, my name is Vincent, and I'll start by stating the obvious. So I think it's fair to say that people were introduced to Apex because of its incredible ability to leverage the Oracle database. Um, they called it a declarative framework before. Now it's low code, but it doesn't really matter because it's all the same, right? Um, the fact is that Apex makes you feel like a superhero because it makes a web application out of your PL SQL skills by making a beautiful application, responsive, accessible. Um, but if you've developed an Apex app lately, chances are that you've been a little, little out of your comfort zone by having to do a little bit of CSS and maybe even some JavaScript. So the learning curve is steep with client-side technologies in, in Apex. So today I'm unveiling this open source project that aims to reduce the pain of coding JavaScript and CSS. Um, so Apex Nitro makes client-side coding much easier by synchronizing static files from your computer directly to Apex. But instead of explaining it, I'm going to do a few demos. Um, all right, and before we actually do a demo of Nitro, um, I've got this application right here. And let's just run it. It's the most basic login page that you've ever seen. Actually, I didn't want to log in. Thanks, Dashlane. Um, go back to 101. So, if I wanted to add some JavaScript to this page, I would go to Page Designer. And then on my page property, I would, um, where is that? Let's refresh. Down, down in the page property, is, there's a section. What's going on here? Um, I'm sorry? understand what's going on here. Okay. Yeah. So if you wanted to add some JavaScript, let's say in the execute on page load, you could do anything. Let's do a very, very simple alert message. And then you would be uh, doing something like from kscope 17. And then you save. And you run that. And there I have my alert message. But, oh, I really wanted to change the message. I, I forgot the uppercase on the from. So I'll go back again to page designer. And I'll change that again. And even add an exclam exclamation mark. So when I save, I can refresh. And I've got my changes. This is all, this is what you're used to, right? But this is not very efficient when you have to do this hundreds of times in a single day when developing. So what Apex Nitro allows you to do is to launch your application from the command line. So you would be doing Apex Nitro launch and then your application name. So Apex Nitro um, 
bundles uh, a few files from your local computer and then it launches your application um, and any so let me split that with my uh, Atom editor and now any change that you do on your local files are being synced directly to your app and before I do that I'll remove the alert from the page because I don't need it anymore so check this out now I've got the same page, but as soon as I do any change on my computer, so I'm gonna have the same alert message, but instead it's from Nitro, and as soon as I save, the page is being reloaded, and the code works as, it, as, as, as you just coded on your computer. And it's even cooler using CSS, because instead of, instead of reloading the page, the CSS is automatically um, inject it on a page. So let's do the same thing with CSS. I, uh, I've got this CSS file right there. Um, and I'll start just doing this guy. So what I want to do is change the background color of this region, okay? So as soon as I save, the background changes. What if I wanted green? There you go. I can change the font size of the header and logo, or basically anything you can do with CSS, you can do here. Let's try to, um, so actually, I've got this second, uh, this third example of CSS I wanna show, but instead of doing it on this file, I will create another one. So right beside my CSS file from, from my local computer, I will uh, copy that, actually I'll, cut it and then I will create a new file in there called dip or whatever kscope.css and then I can paste that so it doesn't matter in which file you're in Apex Nitro will just concatenate everything and push it back to your Apex application um, all right so now I want to log into this app And I will ask someone. Is it on? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. So we often have to do uh, responsive development, right? So you have to test on the browser and on the mobile as well. So what you can do with Nitro is to have all your devices next to you and then just, Christoph, can you, can you scroll, down, scroll down for me because I'm really lazy right now. So all our devices are synced together. You could have a tablet or as many uh, uh, browsers, uh, IE, Firefox or whatever. So it mimics, thank you. So it mimics the scrolling, the typing and also, um, any, yeah, uh, scrolling and typing. So that's, that's very, very useful for responsive development. Um, now the last thing is, um, all these changes, they only apply to you as a developer. So if anyone else um, works on the same application as you, they won't see the changes right away because it's really, really synced to your computer only. But what if you want to push that to, um, like you're thinking the changes are ready, you want to push that to the other developers. So um, one, one very efficient way to do that is to store the files in the shared components within the application static file section. So in this case, I'm having nothing right now because all the changes, are, all, all the files are on my computer. But Nitro has this um, publish feature with, so instead of doing launch, case, the application name, you can do publish, and then Nitro takes all the files within the given directory locally, and it pushes it to the shared components using the APIs from Apex. So it's gonna take a little while, there's a few files to upload, and boom. Now if I refresh here, I'll see that all the files are there, whether it's JavaScript, CSS, or libraries, images. 
So essentially, that's what Nitro is. It really, it really allows you to be much more efficient when dealing with static files. Thank you. Wow. Vincent, where do we get it? Good question. So um, Nitro is available on GitHub under Aura Open Source. So it is free and everyone can get it. It just requires Node.js to install it and that's it. Amazing. Any questions? Yep, we have a few. Crystal, oh. <laughs> oh, sure. So we're all technical here. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit about the secret sauce behind it? I'm sorry? The Can secret you? sauce, what, what makes Apex Nitro work? So the technology behind Nitro is, um, well, actually, there's a lot of tools uh, behind the scenes. But the main, the main tools would be Gulp, which is essentially watching the files locally using Node.js. So Gulp is the watcher of your files. And then there's, there's another tool called Browser Sync that sends um, the packages through WebSocket to Apex. So this is the, um, uh, the sync feature. And then there's a whole lot of, of sub packages like to, con to concatenate the files together, to minify them. So also Nitro minifies all, all, all your files so it's, it's faster to load on your pages as well. Um, there's actually over a dozen features like that um, which makes Nitro what it is. There were other questions. The, uh, you were developing on your local environment. I'm assuming this would work as well if you're developing on a server. Is that? Ab yeah, absolutely. So my, yeah, my instance right now was on my uh, local host. Is that what you're referring yeah. to? So yes, it works on any server or I, I, I've been running it on apexoracle.com for, for a very long time. Awesome. Any other questions? Yeah. In the front, Christoph. <laughs> Is there any version limitation? For example, it's, I guess it's working with uh, Apex 5.1. Is it working, it will be work with 5.2? Oh, sure. Apex. It will work with uh, 5.2 for sure. It's, it works with 5.1. It worked uh, with 5.0. And I think I've been able to make it work in, on 4.2. But that I'm, okay, I don't know if it's still supported. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on Twitter or anything? All right. Great. We're going to take a quick 10 minute intermission. We return well, about at 10 10, and then we'll continue. Thank you.
All right, guys, start getting your seats. We'll get started in 30 seconds. Hey guys, we're gonna get going. Christoph. All right, we're starting again, okay? Do you need me to say something so you can adjust the sound? Very good. All right. We're going to get going here. You can take your seats. All right. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Kerry Millsap. Um, many of you may not be familiar with Kerry, but Kerry's a very well known expert in performance. Kerry is a VP of User Experience Services at Sintra, an owner of Method R Corporation. They make some amazing tools for analyzing trace files and performance related uh, software. And he's a performance specialist who has been helping customers make Oracle go faster since 1989. Kerry, thank you very much for being here in the Apex track. And uh, we, we really enjoy having you here. And thank you. Take it away. Thank All you. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for clapping at the beginning. I like to guarantee. Um, you, you might also clap at this. I have no slides, so don't worry about anything needing to appear either place. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to read for two minutes, and then I'm going to take questions for eight minutes. And then this, according to basic arithmetic, will fill 10 minutes. Very good, <laughs> except for the thing that I'm doing now, which we didn't count for. <laughs> All right, um, actually this is kind of a live version of a two minute tech tip that I did for Bob Rubart for the Oracle Technology Network. So this one will be better because I'm not, um, my face isn't swollen from, from uh, days and days of pollen abuse. Okay, thank you for laughing at that politely. Here's my <laughs> two minute tech tip, here we go. All right, I, I make software for a living. The three-step development process that I use is the process that you should use. Step one, make it work. Step two, make it beautiful. Step three, make it fast. Don't deliver software until you've done all three. If your software doesn't work, it's embarrassing. That's a given. If your software, if your code is not beautiful, then you can't support it, and that's embarrassing. Finally, if your code's not fast, that is embarrassing. So how can you make your code fast? And that's the subject of my, of my reading today. Trace it, all of it, everything you write. Turn on Oracle Database Tracing with DBMS Monitor session trace enable, or with Apex, it's really easy. Ampersand P underscore trace equals yes at the end of your URI. It's easy. Then look at your trace file and find out where all of your time is going. Use a good tool to interpret the trace file. There's no excuse not to. We've got tools that Jorge mentioned that we make. Use our method, our profiler for the best possible results, but use TKProf if you have to. You'll be surprised to see where your program spends its time. It happens to all of us. Now, what if 80% of your response time is going to some Oracle internal database call that you don't understand? Well, the NAT today is the Oracle internal database call that you're going to learn about. So if you get stuck, ask for help. There's plenty of help out there. Now, what if your code's fast, but it's fast for the wrong reasons? Your test tables have 100 rows instead of a billion rows, things like that. There's no load on your system. Well, the solution is to make it easy for your production folks to trace after you give them your code. So make tracing in production a feature of your code. Use the same tool in production to view your trace files that you use in development. Then, then you and your DBAs are on the same page. 
and keep your development trace files. Don't throw those away. They're your baselines. When your performance in production becomes different from the performance in development, you learn. When you learn, you get better. Better is the goal. Tracing makes you better. That's my two-minute tech tip. Trace your code, all of it. Now, that's two minutes worth. And now what I'd like to do is to talk and have you guys participate in the conversation. Here we go. Jorge? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with one thing. It, uh, I think we're mostly developers here. And when you're talking about tracing, we, it sounds like we need to talk to our DBA sometimes. And they may not want to give us trace files. Or they may ask why. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing you advocate that developers have access right. to trace files. And it's really one of, you know, if you, if you talk to an Oracle sales rep about what kinds of things do you have in your catalog that help us ensure performance? Well, they're going to talk to you about, of course, they're going to talk to about the fabulous hardware that they offer and so forth. But they're also going to talk to you about the performance pack, the diagnostics pack. But those things are built for DBAs, right? Not only do, they, do, do people typically not want to give developers access to them, but I don't think most developers want access to that stuff. I, I don't think that learning why um, V$ session weight has a column in it called seconds in weight that doesn't mean seconds in weight. Developers don't need to be spending their time doing that. Developers need to be spending their time doing the things that we've seen on the, on the board today. And so the nice thing about trace data is it's compartmentalized. It doesn't require a bunch of granular, yes, you can have this, no, you can't have that. It's just a file in the operating system that you can bundle up and send to somebody. You can download it through a database. Uh, you know, a database function call. You can, you can access it on a shared drive. It's, it's not something that's complicated to be able to distribute, yet it is a linear sequential record of where all of a developer's code has spent its time. Mm -hmm. So it's the perfect package to, for a developer to be able to see where the code that person's written is spending its time. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Dimitri. Gary, I agree with you completely, but can you give some tips how we as developers uh, can learn about interpreting such a trace file? Yeah, of course. The, the question is, can I, can I give some tips about how developers can learn to interpret a trace file? And it's, it's kind of, I like telling two alternate universe stories here. One is, you, you, you know, a lot of developers are not and don't want to be really Oracle internals, Oracle database internals experts. Um, so the, one, one choice that a project team could make is, well, let's send our developers to five weeks of comprehensive Oracle database administrator training so they learn all about um, Oracle's redo and undo algorithms and learn about locks and learn about latches and learn about all this stuff. Um, but I know for one, I would not want to do that. I would not want to, in, I wouldn't want to go sit for weeks and weeks listening to stuff that I don't have any place in my brain to store. But if you take even an untrained developer, a developer who knows Java very well, or a developer who knows Apex very well, or even a developer that knows PLSQL very well but doesn't necessarily understand the, the nitty gritty stuff that's going on inside of the database, but you show that person, look, here are the database calls that your code is motivating. And here are the operating system calls that the database is making while your code is running. Um, then it becomes, oh, it's just code. And that's really all the Oracle database is. It's just a bunch of C code, a little bit of assembler sprinkled in for good measure. But when you write a program that returns one row at a time to an application, and you look at how that time got spent, and you realize, wow, 85% of the time that a user is waiting on my code is spent waiting on the network. That's weird. If I called my mom at home and said, Mom, I just wrote a program that returns some rows, just like when you visit Google and you see a bunch of stuff come up on the screen, but 80% of my program is, is spending time just moving data from one place to another. That doesn't sound right, does it? What sounds right would be your program spends its time doing the thing that the user wants done, not spending like administrative overhead time moving packets across the network. So a developer with with without even any training, might look at that profile and say, well, why is my code spending 80% of its time on the network? Well, it's a good question. Let's talk maybe to a DBA or maybe to another development colleague who's had this problem before. And he start to learn things like, oh, you know what? 
I don't have to return one row at a time from the database. I can return 10 rows at a time from the database. And the benefit of that is that I can cut my number of network round trips by a factor of 10. So if I was spending 80 seconds before visiting the network, I might be able to spend eight seconds visiting the network and get the same program done. And now, once a developer's seen that, it's with you for the rest of your life. For the rest of your life, you'll be able to recognize that type of a problem. You'll be able to look at a list of how your program spent its time and go, oh, it should never spend that much time on the network. I bet you don't know about the array fetch size parameter, do you? Which we can change in our code. So what happens is you, you, you stumble upon these, these problems, and there are only about 10 of them that will account for probably 95% of the problems you'll ever see in your whole career. The interesting ones are the, the 20 or 30 that, that only happen a half a percent of the time that keep people like me interested because I haven't seen that one before. Um, but no matter what your code spends its time doing, your trace data will show you, it'll tell you. I've seen weird things. I've seen um, file open is the thing that causes this Oracle process to take so long. Well, what is file open? Which file is it opening? And we find out it's opening the Oracle messages file. There's a file called AuraUS.msb that contains the messages, like when you have a unique index constraint violation, that's an Aura00001. But the text of that error message gets read from a file and it's called, oh, there's an index key constraint violation. Well, this code that, that, that had open file as its top time contributor was doing what we used to call an upsert. It's, it's an insert if the row doesn't exist, but if the row does exist, then we want to update it to have a, a slightly different value. So there was always a choice back in the old days about do I want to insert and have the foreign key violation tell me that I need to do an update instead, or do I want to update and have the database tell me there's no row that matches that criteria and you need to do an insert instead. So you had to pick one of the two in the old days before the merge command. Well, they just picked wrong. They picked the one that happened the least often to do first, and Oracle was opening this messages file, and that was like 80% of the time that this little program was consuming doing this little ETL job or something. So it, it might be completely off the charts. It might be something you've never heard of in your life that your code is spending its time doing, but once you know, you can start to use Google, and you can start to use your friends and your network and your contacts and your conference colleagues to figure out what does this thing mean and how do I do less of it? Anybody else? Anything on Twitter? Uh, just a reminder, if you're, on, if you're watching us or listening on Twitter on the live stream, you can ask questions with the Aura CL Apex hashtag. And Gary, thank you very much. Pleasure, Appreciate thank it. you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is Dimitri Gillis. Dimitri is a director at Apex R&D and creator of Apex Office Sprint. Um, is a frequent presenter at all major Oracle conferences and all around really nice guy that is always helping anybody that has a question. Um, Dimitri's done a ton of work on, let's see. <laughs> All right, little technical setups there. All right, so I was saying Dimitri's done a ton of work on obtaining the queries that are behind an interactive report and the filters. Do you ever feel like you want to know what's really happening behind and maybe you programmatically need to do something about it? So this presentation is going to be IG, IR, Veni, Vidi, Vici. Okay, so <clears throat> I think interactive reports are really, really nice. Who's not using interactive reports? Okay, so everybody is using it. But what I've seen is that not many people use the full potential of the interactive report. And uh, yeah, maybe I, can you see it from the back or I can zoom in like this maybe? So just shout if you don't see it. So. Um, let's 
go to just like a plain interactive report. And what I want to concentrate on is just the filters part. We have 10 minutes. So um, how many different ways are there to set a filter of an interactive report and an interactive grid? So the first one is like you click on the header and you click on a value and it's set. So I guess everybody knows this one. The second one that you can do is you like, you go to actions, filter, you select the column you want, you say equal or another operator, you give the value and here it is. So I think everybody knew this, but what I've seen that not many people know is that you can also use the URL to set the interactive report. And you might say, okay, a URL, why would you use that? Well, if you link from another place to this interactive report, then it can be useful to use the URL to set something. What I've seen um, with customers is that they have the same interactive report multiple times and just with different filters or it's, it's organized a little bit different. But you can do that programmatically. So the first thing I want to do is, let's say I want to set um, the last name uh, to Jules. So I say IR and then customer last name. And then I've set it through a URL. Okay, so who didn't know this? Okay, so it proves my point that there's some, something always to learn. And um, so this is one thing. Um, you can go, you can do different things like IR, the default is we want to equal. Uh, so I can do equal, this would, will be the same thing. If I wanted to do, for example, um, less than or greater than, I can use different features here. Or contains, I think it's C, I don't know it by heart. So here it's contains. But now I have two filters. I only want one filter. So how do I get rid of that? So I go here and I say uh, reset interactive report. Uh, I think it's here. So just by manipulating the URL, I can do a lot of things. So I reset it, the interactive report. I can do it like this as well. And then here I use, um, this is normally you put your items and then values. So whenever you put IR and then your expression and then the column name, it will use that. So you don't need to have like a hidden item or something like that. Um, so let me do it again. Okay, so this is the URL. What you can do as well is, um, let's say I have a saved report here, Eugene highlighted, and I want to move from a link or from a button directly to this report. But the default is obviously this. So how can I do that? Again, you go here. Let me take this off. The, the syntax of the URL is always the same, and I'm not going over that here, but it's one, two, three, the fourth parameter, you pass in the request. So I can do here um, IR underscore, and then the name of the report. So I believe it's report one. This is my alias of the report. Oh, the report doesn't exist. So how do I find out what the real name was again? I go to Page designer, application 431, page four. So I go to my report, then I go to attributes. I see the saved reports here. I click on the saved report, and here you see the alias that you defined. So I defined R1. What you also see is the, the link that you can use. So you can just copy it from here and use that. And you can do the same with the primary one. So I, the primary, you give it an alias. For I typically give it primary as alias. And uh, you save it, and the link will automatically be updated. So you can just use this in your button, your, in your link, in your dynamic action. So let me try it again. 
So I wanted to go to um, IR uh, R1, I believe. And here you go. So I go straight to the saved report. And this is a real time saver. Okay. So what's another way of setting a filter? Let me go to the PLSQL side of things. So just by clicking, oops, by clicking here a button, I set a filter. So what's happening behind the scenes here? I have a process, and in the process, I'm setting the filter through PLSQL. There is a package called Apex IR, and it has like a function, add filter or a procedure, and you pass in some parameters and that's it. So programmatically, in your PLSQL code, you can set the interactive reports filters. And you can do a lot more, but I'm just now concentrating on the filter. So who, did, who didn't know about this one? See, it's good to come to the conference. <laughs> Microphone's coming. Hello. Uh, the question is, uh, you have passed the IDs of uh, region ID and report ID. How do you derive them programmatically? Because you have hard-coded it there. Is that same all the time, or will it change? No. So the question is, like, I added here the region ID and the report ID, and I did some, like, I specified other things, but do, those are more um, uh, straightforward. So how do I know the region ID and the report ID? Apex is metadata driven, so everything that's how your Apex application looks like, it's defined in some tables. And that's actually one of the other demos I have where we query the, um, the data that's behind the scenes. And that is what Jorge said, for example, for Apex Office Sprint, we have to look into the metadata of Apex exactly what's happening and what you defined. But just to, um, as you ask the question, you go to uh, your application, and not many people know this either. You go to utilities. There are application express views. So you click on this one, and this gives you a list of the complete metadata of Apex. So here, I already search for interactive, so I get both interactive report and interactive grid. And here I see all the, the views that I can use, for example, the definition of the interactive report. Here I see like which are the, the columns. If I'm doing a group by, what is that looking like? If I have filters and highlights, how is that looking like? In two, and so in the, not the next, but the after that one demo, uh, I will show how you, an example of this, okay? So, <clears throat> so we saw, um, just doing it manually, we saw true URL, we saw true PLSQL. The next thing I use a lot as well is I um, create a hidden page on the I on, on uh, a hidden item on the page, and um, I have a dynamic action on this that refreshes my interactive report. So if I, for example, t type in Frank, the report gets refreshed. So no, I made this item visible, but typically it's hidden. So here I have a link and I can click on it and behind the scenes it's setting this item and it's querying my report. So let me do it again. I click on, for example, Frank. Behind the scenes we set this item. There's a dynamic action that's refreshing this report and the filter is set. You don't see the filter because I'm not using the filter functionality of the interactive report, but I'm using bind variables. So let, let's see behind the scenes what I'm doing here. So this is just a plain uh, text item. Uh, typically, like I use a hidden item and there's a dynamic action that the only thing is doing is refreshing my region. That's it. So very straightforward. What you have to do in your report, 
Like here, you can obviously define how you're do going to do it. Custom, because first name is null or like this. That doesn't really matter. But we have the item here, so the, the bind variable, and that's it. And there's only one thing left on. It's page items to submit. Whenever I refresh the interactive report, I'm going to set this item with the value that is at that moment on the screen. OK? So that's it. Very easy implementation done by Apex, and it's available from, uh, from, for, for a, a very long time. OK. So what happens if you have multiple, who has multiple interactive reports on, on his page? Uh, a few people. Um, so what happens if I um, do the same thing? So I have here my interactive report, and I'm going to try and set a filter. So I'm going to do IR equal, and then customer first name and the value of Frank, and then I get an error. So because I have multiple, multiple interactive reports on this page, Apex doesn't know which one do I need to set. So how do you get around this? It's by using a different syntax. So I can now specify in square brackets, and I pass in the region static ID. So here, IR1, I believe I called it, and it's set now. You see? So very, very powerful uh, way, this URL kind of syntax. So when you want to call another saved report, for example, blue here, you don't have to specify um, the static ID, but you need to make your aliases unique. So um, if I go and look behind the scenes, so here again, I see my two interactive reports, and I see the saved reports. And the only thing you need to make sure of is that this alias is unique. If I type in something um, that already exists, it will uh, give me a warning. Like, you cannot save it. It's not unique. One more minute. OK. I need to ramp up. So here is the data dictionary one. So what I have a lot, or what my customers like, is I have some kind of um, action here. And when I click, I uh, filter the report. So it's a combination of those both things. And here, this, so I'm querying the data dictionary. And I want to dynamically find all the saved reports. So I'm querying this uh, view. I'm querying it for this page, uh, this application. And I only want to see the default one or the alternative users. What Apex is doing behind the scenes as well, if you as a user create a report, there's a session like it will see that. You, if you query it, it will see it. It's homework for you. So I'm doing a combination of two views to get um, the region and the static ID and the alias. So maybe this is not really nice, but what if we switch this to a card template? So I'm switching this to cards. Maybe I quickly, uh, basic. Uh, doesn't matter now, but OK. So here, this is already nice. I see the reports I have on this page. And I can click, and it's now filtering. So just by clicking, I go and I set this thing. Really powerful to make user-friendly applications. The last thing is the interactive grid. And I'm going to switch now to my PowerPoint, because I cannot give all the demos. But here, so when you compare what is possible in an inter interactive report and interactive grid, all the things that I showed are possible, except for two things. Like the URL is not yet available in the interactive grid. And uh, the Apex IR package that I'm using behind the scenes is not available in, in, in an interactive grid. So what is there? You can use bind variables. There is a lot, a ton of JavaScript, and John went over that in, um, in, on Sunday. And you can query the data dictionary. It's complete. It's, it's done there. Um, just when you download the slides, um, I'm telling what I, what I uh, did. And I have a documentation link in the slides. 
so you can see it. The same with interactive grid. Here are all the views. Um, one more thing, and then I'm done. Um, there's a nice sample application called sample reporting, and this goes in a lot more depth of what I showed. Um, so go and, and, and watch that, and then I'm done. All right. Our next presenter is going to be Shakib Rahman. Uh, I think all of you know or have heard about Shakib. Uh, Shakib is uh, the uh, he works with the Oracle Apex team, and he's a creator of the universal theme, and all around uh, obsessive with design and good looks of our, of our applications. He's going to talk about a very popular application within Oracle, uh, area people, how the most popular Apex app within the company was redesigned and the UX decisions behind it. All right, can everyone hear me okay? I apologize for my voice. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk about how we designed Aria People. This is the most popular app within Oracle and some of the design decisions behind it. So I'll show you a lot of screenshots. Uh, it might be a little bit quick, uh, so let's get started. So here's what Aria People looks like today and what is Aria People. So for people that don't know, you might have, you might have heard it from other uh, uh, people's talks. This is an employee directory application for Oracle. So every employee within the company is in this application. Uh, this is the most popular Apex app by far within the company. At least we don't know of another app that's more popular than this. It gets about a million hits a day, actually more than that. That's the average over an entire year. Uh, just to show you the usage of ARIA people, if you look at this chart right there, uh, what do you think those dips are? Those are the weekends, that's correct. And what do you think that one really big dip is right here? That's right. So we had a winter break at Oracle, so we had the last week off. And you can tell that people actually stopped working. They, they actually did take the time off, and we can see it right here. So why do a redesign? Uh, well, the last redesign was five years ago, and it was actually designed by me. So this is one of my first projects when I joined, the, uh, when I joined Oracle. Uh, back in 2009, I started working on Aria, and it just sat around for a year, and then it was finally deployed to production. And what you see right now at the current Aria, the screenshot I showed you, uh, that was actually designed by me. So that's my work, and so it's a great opportunity to see like how far I've, I've like you know what I've learned in the last five years. Uh, but also, it's an opportunity to showcase Apex within the company. So. Uh, Apex, uh, sorry, Aria is the most popular apps, and people, when people see it, it's a reflection of what Apex is and what Apex uh, can do within the company. So we want to make sure that we have our best foot forward. Uh, also, the existing Aria didn't have a good responsive story. It wasn't a responsive application. It was using an older theme. So we wanted to fix that. We wanted to make it so it works on mobile devices. Uh, and finally, and probably most importantly, we wanted to provide a better user experience. If this application is being used by 130,000 people every day, it has to have a stellar user experience, and that was the goal. So what I want to talk about is here's uh, five areas which we improved or added uh, to make the experience a little bit better. So let's get started. And this is the existing ARIA homepage. And if you just look at it, there's links all over the place. It doesn't have a very coherent story. Uh, if I look at the navigation, it says home and then tags. Uh, tags aren't even used that much, and maybe because uh, the experience isn't that great. Uh, there's a section for links, but there's also links below the links. There's another section for links. Uh, there's five links for managing your profile. Um, overall, it looks a little bit bland. And if you're going to the website every single day, multiple times a day, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, room for improvement here. So here's what the new ARIA looks like. And the first thing you see is this amazing like, uh, shot of the Oracle campus. And I think it looks really beautiful, but this is an amazing shot. And Again, the, the focus on ARIA is we want to get people in and get people out. So how do we do that? We focus them on search, right? This is what the Google approach was. This is what we did in ARIA. This is what a lot of websites are doing. They focus on search. Um, not only that, but having this nice large image makes it a little bit friendly, right? You're not intimidated. It's not some boring website anymore. You kind of see a nice image. And we may actually change this. We may change it up so we see different images every now and then. 
Uh, also, there's only three links below the search bar, and that's advanced search. So if you can't find something from your normal search, you can go to advanced. You might know exactly what you're looking for. Uh, you can update your profile, and we wanted to advertise this new lists feature, so that's why it's there. Uh, in the old website, if I typed in my name and I search, and this is like screenshots from production data, so that is my email and home uh, and phone number. This is how the search results look like. So I, if I type in Shakib, it would actually take you directly to my page, but I just kind of stop just to show you. And the distance between the search bar to the results is way too large, right? It, why is there like these three links in between that tell me about like how many people have tags? Like it just doesn't make any sense. So we went from something like this. And, and also another point, uh, I got my name because I spelled it correctly. What if I spelled it wrong? What if I spelled Shakib with a Q? or S-H-A-K-I-B or something, I wouldn't find myself. And until recently, you'd get no results. Uh, we've changed that now, and here's what the new search looks like. So you have uh, a very simple page. I type in Shakib in the search result, in the search field, and immediately below it, I see my results. So the first name, I get Shakib because I actually spelled my name correctly, but below it, I also see other employees that have similar sounding names. Now I've redacted the data so you can't really see, but the name should give you enough that you don't have to have the most perfect spelling of someone's name in order to still find them. Uh, another example is, like, let's say if I'm looking for Joel Coleman, and I thought Joel's name was Joe Coleman, if I type that in, I would actually find Joel. Uh, in the results, in the UI itself, we have a larger image, uh, we have a flag indicating where the user is from. You can use your keyboard to navigate, so it's a very simple UI. Uh, let's look at the profile page. So this is how the profile page looked like in the old version of ARIA. And just by looking at it, there's like three levels of navigation. First, you still have that home, but now there's a new profile tab, and then there's tabs. Uh, but also, you have this hierarchical, uh, like a, your higher, reporting hierarchy, right, going back up to the board of directors, uh, and then you have this sub-navigation just for your profile page, so I can look at your details, your org chart, org search, and so on. And then you get to the actual meat of the matter, which is, hey, who am I, right? So my, person's, my, my profile photo is to the right, uh, which has information below it, and then I have information to the left, and there's seemingly no reason why information is presented in that way. Not only that, the fonts are smaller, it's harder to read, uh, there's just a lot of room for improvement. And here's what it looks like if I just scroll down. So there's a whole lot of content here, you have to scroll actually a lot to get to the information you want. So probably one of the most important pieces of information is my profile section. Like what does Shakib actually do at Oracle? And that's hidden at least a page down. Let's look at the new design. So this is how the new ARIA uh, homepage looks like. And you can see it's very simple. It's a lot simplified now. There's a very clear header and uh, hierarchy reporting structure. And then I have a nice hero image, and this is the image I can upload. So now we're kind of empowering employees to personalize their profile page and add a little personality to it. Not only that, but the left column has the most important piece of information about your profile. It has your name, your title, uh, which organization you are, where you work. Uh, and then if you're logged in as yourself, you have your update profile button. Below that, you have your contact information, your other links, and so on. To the right, the first thing you see is about what does this person actually do. And we're hoping that by doing this, we're encouraging people to actually fill this information out. So here's how it looks as you scroll down. Okay. So of course, the idea was to make this responsive. And here's how it looks when it's responsive. On that small side to the, uh, to the right of the screen, you see that we just kind of compress everything. You still have the photo, you still have the hero image, and everything that's most important, as I mentioned uh, before, shows up there. Uh, this is using 90% universal theme and 10% custom UI, some templates, and some JavaScript. Uh, just to show them side by side, you can just look. It's, it's about the same size of page, but the information, uh, the visual hierarchy is completely different, right? It shows you different pieces of information. How much time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes? All right, let's go quick. Here's the org chart. Here's how it looked before. And you see that you lose a lot of context. In the new one, it's a lot different. Now you, contain, you maintain the same context, you have the org chart in the separate, uh, in like the middle area of your page. Uh, before, if you wanted to update your profile in the old system, this is how it looked like. There was a lot of links here, so uh, there's a lot of cognitive load on how to actually update your profile. There's five different places you can go. Uh, in fact, here's all the things you'd have to go through to update your profile to have a comprehensive uh, profile on RA people. 
In contrast, here's how it looks like now. You scroll down, everything's on one page, and you can add as many things as you want. So it's all simplified. Uh, the last thing I want to show you is something called lists. Now, with Oracle's large company, and you work with a lot of different people across teams, it's not always that you're working with people within your own team. So if I'm working with uh, 10 people across three different teams, I need to have, I need to have a way to group them together uh, just for myself. I, I don't need to have this information be public, but I need it somewhere so I can say, oh yeah, the Cloud QA team, they're these group of people from these different uh, managers, but they all work together. So let's say that I wanted to go to Joel's uh, profile page, and I wanted to add him to a list. Here's how I would do it. I'd go to his page, I'd click on Add to List, I'd just type in a name, it already has a thing checked. I'd pick a color, and I add Joel, I added Joel to the Apex team list. This is an example of a dead, simple UI, right? There's no thinking required. And the reason why is because we have 130,000 employees, 140,000 employees, not everyone is gonna be an engineer or a computer genius or, you know what, that doesn't even matter. You wanna simplify this process down to its essence so that anyone can use it. It's, it's really uh, brain dead simple. And if I wanted to add Joel to an existing list, here's how I do it. I click on the add to list button and you'd already see Apex there. All I have to do is click anywhere on that list and I could add him. Or I can click on create new list, it'll focus me on a new field and that's it. And here's how a list looks. When I go to actually look at a list, here's all the people, here's an, uh, a, t a list that I have for Apex team members, you see their profile image, you see their, uh, it's just like search results, but now I can send them all an email, I can download them a CSV, or I can add the list. So just to simplify, just in five points what we've done is we've simplified common interactions, right? We've given users more control. Now they have more control over their profile page. We've designed for mobile, we've reduced the complexity of doing more complex tasks like going, modifying your profile. Uh, and finally, we want to get users hooked, and we're hoping that by doing this, people will participate more, participate more in ARIA, they'll upload their photos, they'll use their update their about text, and they'll overall have a better user experience. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Keith. Yep. Any comments, questions while Joel sets up? Yep, hold on. Uh, Shakib. <clears throat> Shakib. Yep. In order to uh, simplify the UI, would you actually remove functionality? So <clears throat> basically, you have uh, the simple stuff, the more advanced, more complex features. Would you actually remove stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And actually, I didn't show this as well. The, the question was would you remove things from the UI or, or just featured functionality to make it simpler? And I think the answer is yes. You, you would definitely remove things. And we've removed a few things from the profile page and other pages as well. So before, uh, every little region would have an edit button saying, oh, here's how, where you'd go to edit this information. We're planning to put that on another page. Uh, we had another region that showed, I think, like uh, some Beehive integration. And we're going to put that in a way that makes sense. So I definitely think it makes sense to remove uh, you know, whatever is cluttering the UI or whatever it seems unnecessary. If, if it's not being used by 80% of your people, then why have it there? Yeah. Final question. Um, yep. what, was, what was the technology used for the similar sounding names? That was all using Oracle text, and actually uh, Joel right here and Carson Zarsky on the Apex team helped a lot with that. Wonderful. Thank you. Yep. Our next presenter is Joel Kalman. Um, well, everybody just knows Joel, so uh, I'm just gonna say he's uh, our senior, he's a uh, director, software development, manages all development for Apex, and I mean, who doesn't know Joel here? Yeah. Raise your hand. Great. <laughs> and if I understood what Joel was gonna just talk about, I would talk about it, but. Um, let me know when, when he gave me a title, said, yet another Apex app, and something in French, I think. Okay, yeah. is that okay? Do I have just two minutes as well? Go for it. Um, before I get going, I just wanna ask, is anybody here who is really new to Apex, has never done anything with Apex, and is leaving this conference like you're just charged up and you're gonna do, uh, uh, th this is it. Um, oh boy, I got one book and three people. Um, are, do you do you both work for the same company or different companies? Oh, sorry, uh, you will be the proud owner of the uh, 
new Apex 5-1 book from uh, uh, Ari Geller and Brian Spendolini. So pick it up uh, when we're done here, okay? It's weird to see how excited people get about a book. Um, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, today's talk, uh, yet another Apex app, To La Bombe. So you might be wondering, um, what does to la bombe mean? And actually, it's, uh, it's French-Canadian slang. Uh, to meaning everything or all. Uh, and bomb, of course, you know what bomb means, right? So to la bombe, in French, you translate that to English. It's let's wreck this together, right? Blow everything up. <laughs> vraiment, vraiment, mes amis? Yeah. So what are we going to wreck today? So I want to begin um, with just a very simple question, and that is, is Apex used at Oracle? I don't know. I mean, there's probably a billion ways we could answer this question. In the era of hashtags, I, I'm not quite sure how we can pronounce this one, uh, Y-A-A-A, -A -A. I mean, maybe if you're from Texas, it almost sounds like y'all. Um, you know, but it stands for yet another Apex app, right? That's, uh, that's today's topic. Uh, Mike Kichwa um, is my boss, vice president, friend, uh, and he's the vice president of database tools uh, at Oracle. Uh, Mike's the creative genius of Apex. Uh, he originally invented WebDB in the 90s. Uh, and Mike invented Apex. I was the first developer of an Apex application on the planet, but really the framework that is Apex uh, is originally Mike's invention alone. I might come up with a novel idea a month, seriously. Uh, Mike might come up with uh, 10 a day, and so he is seemingly uh, unlimited. There's also another gentleman, Vlad Uvarov, uh, who leads and manages our development for the database cloud services. And between Mike and Vlad and myself, we have a little bit of a tradition where we will stumble across an application inside the company that just so happens to be written in Apex, and we'll send each other a message and say, yet another Apex app, and we'll you know, give a link to the unmistakable URL and it's interesting that Vlad's in this as well, because Vlad's been heavily engaged in leading the database cloud efforts ever before there was an Oracle cloud. So he's really seen the expansion of this and everything related to cloud at Oracle as well. And this tradition, we've been doing for years, for years. So what are some good examples? We stumbled across uh, online payroll query templates. So the global payroll group, they, instead of you sending them an email, they built a small Apex app to ingest all the requests. Another good one, uh, manufacturing and distribution. They have their, I'll call it their internal front office system written in Apex. Last year, anybody who went to Oracle Open World in the past, you would go to Oracle Open World, you'd go to the desk, you'd get your shirt. But starting last year, you order them through this Apex app, every Oracle employee. One of my favorite ones, um, this lady by the name of Kim Henderson uh, at headquarters, she's in human resources. She's not a programmer. And she wrote an application to report on the holidays for each country and province in the world at Oracle. So we can see how, how many more days that uh, our friends in Austria and Ireland get than us poor suckers in the US. <laughs> but, but, it, but the important fact is, she's not a programmer at all. So Oracle's a large organization. I know Shakib talked in very generics. I have very specific information here. So as of yesterday, probably changed today, there's 138,821 employees at Oracle, employees and contractors. There's 1,232 official titles. 
uh, in contrast to discretionary where you can make it up, there are official titles at Oracle, and these are a wide variety, right? Managing counsel, PC board designer, market research analyst, it's a lot, lots of titles. There's many organizations at Oracle as well, 5,228, believe it or not. Oracle's a large Fortune 500 company, just like many other organizations around the planet. And Oracle has to do many things to keep the lights on and running the business. We're a business just like you are. And so while Oracle, I believe, sells and markets world-class enterprise software and services, there will always be gaps, always, for every, every problem. And some people look at that as, gee, that's a bad thing, like our Fusion Apps isn't solving this problem, or our HCM isn't solving this specific problem. There will always be gaps. And the business is always gonna find a way to solve it, maybe with Excel, maybe with Access, maybe with uh, Apex and the Oracle database. And so in a large way, these gaps are being filled by Application Express and the Oracle database at Oracle. Andy Mendelson is the Executive Vice President of Database Server Technologies at, at Oracle. And I have tremendous respect for Andy. Uh, he joined Oracle in 1984. So when I graduated high school in 1984, Andy joined Oracle and he was literally, I, I like to say, changing the world. Because I look at Andy, he helped create something that has impacted and given careers to hundreds of thousands of people, maybe millions. Everybody in this room probably can say, gee, Andy helped give me a career. And occasionally I have the good fortune just to be in the presence of an executive like Andy. And I'll sit and listen. And I find it fascinating to watch and learn from them because people like Andy, you don't learn from them by what they say, you learn from them by what they ask. And so you can get in their head and see, okay, this is, this is what's going on. So when Mike Hitchell and I, when we just make these you know, great proclamations, you know, Apex is really killing it at Oracle and overgrowing, oh, Andy's gonna say, how do you know? How, how do you really know? So he's very big on measuring something and improving it rather than just have these very opaque statements. So back to Mike Hitchwa. Um, Mike is never short of energy or, or lofty goals. And within the past year, he stated his intention of showing at Oracle that over the last trailing 12 month period, we had over a billion page views of Apex inside the company on services managed by, by Oracle. And that, that's billion with a B. Um, so seemingly impossible, and I thought there's just absolutely no way. So I started it, I wrote a couple REST services and SQL statements, and uh, Mike started writing this Apex app to collect, to periodically get the stats from these instances that we run and start to build this up, and we were light years away from a billion. Light years. So this advanced uh, quite rapidly in the past year with our free agent acquisition, uh, Karsten Zarski, and uh, he took the task and he completely attacked the problem. So he contacted all these owners of different Apex instances throughout the company. Um, he, he developed a REST uh, interface and REST services inside Apex 5.1, so now somebody upgrades to Apex 5.1, they can run a little script, give us uh, the OAuth, and so now we can monitor this in real time and it all comes back to the cockpit. So we gathered this information both manually and automatically. Obviously, if somebody didn't upgrade to Apex 5.1, well, we had to give them a script, they would send us the data, and we would load it in the little cockpit here. And it's fascinating because there were nine data centers, 48 instances, 97,000 workspaces, 166,000 apps, And just about a month ago, on May 25th, 
for a trailing period of Apex instances managed by Oracle, it was 1 billion and 1 million page views of Apex at Oracle, which is astounding. So when I say that I make this very bold statement that Apex dominates app dev at Oracle, we have the stats to prove it. So we have a fantastic, enthusiastic community of Apex people inside Oracle. So people are very familiar with this very passionate community here, but we have the similar one inside Oracle, and we treat these customers like gold no differently than we treat our external customers. And so I wanted to gather some information before this conference about some of these apps, and I started to send an email, and I said, okay, uh, can you, know, you just describe your app, tell me how people use it, and send me a screenshot. And like right when I was getting ready to hit send, I stopped, and I said, this is madness, right? I'm gonna get bombarded with emails and attachments, and blow out my email quota. So I wrote an app in 15 minutes. And I put a link to that, which was great, because the response was utterly overwhelming from inside Oracle. So I would like to take, I know I'm short on time, Jorge, is this okay? Um, I want to show you some of these apps. And to add to the dramatic effect, if I can, um, I put it to music, which people know this is sort of my deal.
So, friends, to go back to our original question, is Apex used at Oracle? I will give you a billion resounding yeses. To the bomb. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. This concludes the Let's Wreck, the, Let's Wreck This Together Apex Talks, and we're ready for the closing ceremony that starts in about four minutes. Thank you very much.